So the first Sunday of every month, I want to do a video on a hero from history. Talk about the good things and the bad things and what we can learn from both. I know this one's going out late, but uh, I'm going to record the rest of them and get ahead. So the first guy I'm going to go over and talk about is Nehemiah. I got some notes here. Uh, hopefully I won't have to use all these cards. It won't take that long. But the reason I'm doing Nehemiah first is because I just changed my tagline to a reference from Nehemiah, or actually a quote from Nehemiah 2.20. And we'll get to that as we go. So Nehemiah was working for the king of the Syrian Empire. And he was his cupbearer. And what a cupbearer does is they, they uh, pour the wine for the king and then take a sip of it and give it to the king to make sure it's not poisonous. And uh, if Nehemiah died, then the king would be like, I ain't drinking that. So it's a, it's a very high position. Uh, you have to really trust the guy because if you don't trust your cupbearer, uh, he could be the one that poisons you. So Nehemiah asked some uh, fellow Jewish Jews about how the, the people living in Israel and the temple in Jerusalem were. And they told him some bad news. The people were poor. They were desperate. They weren't following God's law. The wall around Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Babylonians and hadn't been rebuilt. They were trying to rebuild the temple, but they couldn't rebuild the temple because they didn't have a wall around the city. And raiders and people from other countries that didn't like them would come in and destroy the temple and haul off all the good stuff. So, uh, what Jeremiah does is he, uh, he mourns the condition of his people and the temple in Jerusalem. He also fasts and prays. Then he goes to the king and he's doing his normal job and he looks sad. And the king goes, Hey, I've never seen you sad before. And he's like, Well, I'm sad because of what's going on with my people. And he has this plan. He knows he's going to look sad in front of the king. So he's already prayed about his plan and uh, got his plan all thought of and everything he needs to do to ask the king in order to, to fulfill or follow his plan he's got. So the first important lessons here are uh, he prays and fasts not only about what's going on in Jerusalem, but what he can do to help solve the problems. And he's in a position where he can do a lot of good, so he pre-plans what he's going to do when he goes to talk to the king. And uh, we should both pray fast about what's going on, bad things that are going on, and pray and fast about things we can do to fix those problems. And plan things out before jumping in. All right. Already did that one too. Already two sheets down. Okay, so he goes to Jerusalem. Oh, and some of the stuff he asked for the king, he asked the king to send letters to uh, kings that are under the that are ruled by his, the king that he's the cupbearer for. That guy's like the emperor and he has lesser kings underneath him. So he goes to Jerusalem. Or he, he, I'm sorry, he asked his king to have the kings under him provide him with some of the resources and materials that he needs to rebuild the wall. Uh, like timbers for rebuilding gates and a, a few other things. And also uh, ask him for protection so he has a letter of protection so people won't just kill him. Because a lot of people don't like the Jews and don't want him to rebuild the wall and rebuild the city. So he gets to Jerusalem and they want to have this big party and stuff for him. He's like, no, no, we're not going to do any of that stuff. He's like, I just want to come here and uh, look around. So he waits till evening when nobody else is around and bothering him and he goes and takes his horse assume a horse it just says a, an animal he's riding uh horse donkey camel i don't know some critter from dr seuss and he goes completely around the wall of jerusalem and 
takes notes on everything that needs to be done to fix the wall. Because if they don't fix the wall, they can't rebuild the temple and they can't leave peacefully because these other nations will come in and bother them. And he figures out the exact plan of everything he needs to accomplish and the amount of time he told the king it would take him to get done. Because the king wants his cupbearer to come back. So he's got to hurry up and get all this stuff done. So he gets to all the people, gets them together, and they start rebuilding the wall. But they don't all start like on the northeast corner and work their way around. He has everybody start rebuilding the wall around their own house. So they're responsible for the part of the wall that protects them and keeps them and their family safe. And that way the whole wall can be built all at once. And that's where uh, the important lesson I want to emphasize from Jeremiah comes from. We should be building walls, and I've talked about this in other videos recently, walls to protect us, around us. Now, I don't mean like physical walls and build a castle and a moat around your house, even though that'd be cool. I mean metaphorical walls, like we should have uh, have our hearts right, we should have get rules We should for our lives, we should follow God's teaching, we should be uh, doing other things to defi be able to protect ourselves, like uh, storing extra food in case we get laid off and we can, that way we can protect our families by feeding them, stuff like that. Alright, so then... The enemies of Jerusalem and uh, Nehemiah's enemies start to mock him. And then, uh, as they build the wall, they're like, ah, look at that. That wall's pathetic. A fox could knock it over. And uh, as they keep building the wall higher and higher, they, these enemies realize that, hey, these guys are actually going to build the wall. So they start threatening them and say, hey, if you don't stop building, we're going to come kill you. And that's an important thing to remember the enemies of our enemies, our spiritual enemies, and uh, other enemies we may have, they'll mock you at first, but when they see that you're doing really well and ignoring their mocking, they're going to escalate and start threatening you. Uh, it's a common tactic in politics. You mock, like, well, those crazy people over there. and Or uh, you'll hear a lot of people, like, Christians are crazy. You don't have to worry about Christians. Well, there's a lot of these uh, now Antifa types and those kind of people and other black block people that are like, hey, we need to do something about these Christians. Uh, they passed this, like, they're saying, oh, look, Christians got rid of abortion, so Jane's Revenge is now burning down churches. Uh, they've burned almost 100 churches or pro-life uh, crisis pregnancy centers since the overturning of Roe versus Wade. So, you know, first they, they'll mock you, and then they'll start threatening you and start actually uh, fighting you. But uh, the correct response, what Jeremiah does, is he doesn't send his people out to go attack these guys and fight back. What he says is keep building the wall. Keep building this protection we need. Uh, keep, In our case, keep studying the Bible. Keep uh, learning to live a better life. Uh, I need to start exercising more and losing weight and getting in better shape. Stuff like that. That's what I mean by the wall in this case. Metaphorical. The lesson we're trying to learn here. And he says, I want all of you to start carrying your sword with you when you rebuild the wall. Now, if you uh, fast forward to later in the Bible, I want to say Corinthians. I should have looked this up first. But Paul talks about the whole armor of God. And he talks about the Word of God, uh, the Bible, and in his case, the letters and uh, the Gospels that were circulating around, and the Old Testament. But the, the Word of God, God's commandments, God's lessons, God's teaching, that's the sword of God. So we need to be equipped with that. We need to know it, study the Bible, read the Bible regularly. That way we know what is true and not true, and we're able to fight the real fight and the real demons out there um the real the real problem out there because again another new testament phrase probably everybody's heard is we don't fight against flesh and blood but but 
against principalities. Uh, that means we, we're there's a spiritual war out there. And we're fighting the spiritual war. We need to be equipped by knowing the Bible, and that's carrying the sword for our spiritual battle. And so Jeremiah tells everybody to carry their sword while building the wall. And then they come into where they have a problem. A lot of the people are having trouble building the wall because they don't have money to buy food and stuff like that. Well, it turns out a lot of the noble people were uh, charging them interest and ownership regul charging them way too much interest and stuff. And there's a law that says you shouldn't charge other believers interest. Uh, and Jeremiah comes in, he cleans house. He's like, no, you got to give everything back. You got to stop charging your fellow believers interest. And start doing fair business practices with them. And we should all be doing more business with each other. And more business with fellow believers. And make sure that's fair business. Honest scales. Don't charge interest or owners or put uh, owner risk restrictions on them. Fair business with it. Um, and sharing stuff and cooperating with other believers. Like at the end of this month, me and my little preparedness group are going to get together and we're going to process a ton of apples, uh, apple cider, uh, apple butter, uh, apple sauce, stuff like that, off of some trees so uh, that my late, wife aunt, late wife's aunt has. That's the kind of stuff, building community and uh, cooperating and stuff like that. Instead of, uh, I, me and Sarah could easily take a weekend. I take a day off work. She takes a day off work. We process all the apples and then try to sell them. It's much better if we just get together as a group and help everybody and everybody walks away with what they want instead. Now, I'm not saying don't go out and make money because we all have to make money to pay our bills. Uh, then you got the bad guys that, uh, again, were threatening them and stuff. They set a trap to kill Nehemiah. Well, Nehemiah is busy with building the wall and all this stuff and... He doesn't have time to mess with these people. He's like, no, no, I'm not going to deal do that, deal with you guys. And they want him to leave the city and get away from everybody else so that way they can kill him. And he's like, no, I'm not falling for your tra trap because he's looking out for what's going on and uh, prepared to deal with this kind of stuff. We need to be looking out for traps from, from spiritual people like, hey, uh, you know, Come hang out with us. Like some guys from work. Like hey come out with us after work. We're going to go drinking. And these aren't good guys. You, you don't don't go out with them. Don't don't tempt fate. Just stay away from anything like that. That might be a spiritual trap. And then Nehemiah is like the acting governor of Jerusalem at this time. And he even talks to the, these people that are causing trouble. Not only the... Uh, the bad guys that are trying to kill him, but also the uh, guys charging interest and doing unfair business practices. He's like, guys, like you need to straighten your life up. He's like, look at me. I'm doing the best I can. Um, even though he's entitled to all these taxes and all this free food and stuff from the people, he's actually paying for all the food that he's eating and all the food that his friends and stuff are eating out of his own pocket instead of taxing the people for it. Um, It'd be really great if we had leaders that were uh, living off their own income and stuff instead of taxing the people and doing insider trading and stuff to get rich. And if you're in one of those positions, be more like Nehemiah and uh, pay for stuff out of your own pocket. And I'm not just talking about like, political leaders at the top. Clear down to like local mayors and dog catchers and stuff like that and people that work for the city street department and stuff like that. I've seen a lot of people that in all kinds of positions do a lot of corrupt stuff and uh, make money off the taxpayers back instead of doing their job the way they're supposed to. Um, so Jeremiah, had his time that he told the king that he would be in Jerusalem's up, he heads back to uh, Syria, hanging out with the king. And when he goes there, the, uh, the Jewish people that are left behind in Israel, uh, they start doing the stuff that got them in trouble and got them exiled to begin with. They're marrying, they're letting their kids marry outsiders. 
uh, they're doing all kinds of stuff like that. And the reason you're not supposed to, Jews aren't supposed to marry outsiders is the same reason uh, Christians aren't supposed to marry non-believers. Now, if you're a Christian, or if you're already married and become a Christian, don't get divorced. But if you're Christian, you should only marry another Christian. And that's because we're supposed to be equally yoked. We're supposed to be partners in the relationship. And that includes our relationship with God. Uh, I had my preacher explain it like a triangle. So the two married people are down here and God's up here. As the two people move closer to God, they get closer to each other too. I think that's a really good example. So uh, we, we should try to keep, and not just marital relationships, all our relationships we can with believers. Now, I'm not saying avoid non-believers because we're supposed to evangelize to them. Um, so Nehemiah comes back to Jerusalem and then he, uh, he starts cleaning house. He's like, Hey, you guys got to stop doing this. He set, starts laying down the rules. There's even one of the bad guys from earlier that was trying to kill him is now living in the temple. Uh, so he kicks that guy out of the temple and takes all the, uh, artifacts and all the stuff that's supposed to be used for worshiping God and puts them back in that room that that guy took over. And then him and the uh, head priest start working together to teach the people God's law. And I think anybody in a leadership position should be working to teach God's law and backing up their preachers. And I don't mean just mean a leadership position as a uh, politician or a leadership position in a church. Uh, leadership positions could be like you're a boss at work. Or you're a parent. Or leadership of your family. You working with your spouse to teach. Make sure the whole family has a relationship with God. So uh, that's all I have for Nehemiah. Those are the, the lessons we can learn. And I managed to say Nehemiah every time. And not call him Jeremiah by mistake. Which I have been doing a lot. And uh, so I'm going to try to do. Like I said earlier. going to try to do this every Sunday. Or Saturday, first, or try to do this the first Saturday of every month. So if you got any ideas for any other heroes or that I should do, and I want to talk about the good things and the bad things they did. Nehemiah, we don't know what if he did any bad things. I'm sure he screwed up and sinned too. So other guys, I'm going to try to find some people like David or some other people that have some really major sins that we can learn from too. So if you have any suggestions for anybody, leave them down in the comments for me. Uh, I hope you got something out of this, and thank you uh, for watching, and remember, we, his servants, will start rebuilding.